So, thank you so much. It's a great pleasure to be here. So, first, a thank to Ron and his family for a fantastic initiative. Also, thanks to Linda and the Open Medicine Foundation for inviting me. So, I will take you on a bit of a tour. We will go to uh, somewhere in the world where some of you haven't been. And I think today, when we have to struggle, all of us have to help out uh, to struggle for keeping the importance of facts and uh, science and knowledge, I will start showing you where Uppsala is. <laughs> so Uppsala is in the country of Sweden, a very, very far away place in, up in the dark north on the other side of the earth. Uh, however, we have to struggle a bit to explain where Sweden is and uh, we approach people sometimes with knowledge of uh, less uh, uh, exactness, so to say. So Sweden, this is Sweden. <laughs> Typical Swedish nature, water, boats, uh, red houses with white corners or white houses, wooden houses. The Swedish flag is a blue flag with a yellow cross. This is Switzerland. <laughs> Switzerland is another country, right? <laughs> it's in the Central Europe part, and it's a flag with a cross, yes, but it's a white cross on a red back background. They have tall mountains. We have some mountains in Sweden, but not as tall. <laughs> Swedish people dress up sometimes, not so often, but sometimes, uh, as you see here to the left, the Swedish royal family, or part of the royal family dress up in the Swedish traditional clothing. Switzerland don't have a royal family. <laughs> Instead, they jodel, build the cuckoo clocks, and uh, I don't know what you're using this tool for, probably a music instrument, I think. <laughs> However, there are some common features between Switzerland and Sweden. We are both two peace-loving countries, and interestingly enough, there is a very interesting correlation between the number of Nobel laureates and amount of consumption of chocolate. <laughs> Someone with too much time had probably f figured this one out, I don't know. So you see Sweden and Switzerland are doing quite well. US, well, I don't know what you have to do. Maybe shape up on your educational system, consume more chocolate, I don't know. We'll see. So let's go into this very, very important uh, task for today to see what we can do when we look at a disorder like MECFS. And I will bring you to the Swedish cohort, and that is, of course, a small population. And I hope I will be able to tell you that even in a small population, uh, sorry, now something jumped here, uh, we are able to actually find very important things because we can do a very controlled study on a small isolated cohort. So the approach we take, and this is from my personal interest, is to get to the area of location of potential disorders. So I work quite a lot with neurodegenerative diseases and neuroinflammatory reactions in the brain. So of course if we can get to the tissue and we can measure things in the tissue, that's fantastic. But however, the brain is not so easy to get to. And especially to get control material from brain is very difficult. If someone offers to give parts of their brain for a research from healthy brain, they're probably not totally healthy. <laughs> blood, on the other hand, is quite easy to get. And everybody is voluntarily giving a drop of blood or so to research. And the Swedish population is extremely altruistic, I have to say. So it's never a problem to get samples. However, blood is a bit far away, and as we heard from the former presenters, there's actually a lot of other things in blood that may discriminate the signals we want to get to. So we prefer to work with cerebrospinal fluid. I will tell you a bit of what that is. So cerebrospinal fluid is the liquid that surrounds our brain. It's produced centrally in, in the nervous system in a region called choroidus plexus, and it circulates around the central nervous system and equilibrates with the chemistry in the brain. However, you have to get it by a rather invasive sampling. You have to do lumbar puncture. We produce five to 600 milliliters per day. So we replenish this volume of 150 milliliters several times a day. And in a normal sampling in Sweden, we draw 10 to 12 uh, milliliters of this liquid. So actually within a half an hour or so, you have replenished this volume. 
However, you have to take a lumbar puncture, which is a sort of invasive thing. I have done it on myself just to make sure it's not painful, and it's not. If you get the right person to do it, nothing you do at home, I tell you. Uh, local anesthesia, and we have a special procedure where we draw the sample very slowly and on a very fine needle, and there are almost never any complications afterwards. Uh, this is the reason why I got into the field of MECFS. We were doing a collaborative work together with colleagues at NIH, and we were collecting healthy individuals. So I collected about 200 healthy individuals from Sweden, and in US you had the possibility to collect a few patients here and on a repetitive basis. And we published a study where we actually have shown what is this, the blueprint of a healthy brain cerebrospinal fluid content when it comes to proteins. Uh, and we published that in 2010. Uh, I have to admit, it's maybe not the most exciting paper to read. It's a <laughs> rather long paper also, don't print it. It's freely available, you can download it if you want. 776 pages long list of different proteins in there and peptides and modifications. But this led us to the possibility to start comparing the liquid with different patient groups. And in the collaborative consortium, there were people interested in, in two different disorders. So as you see, post-treatment Lyme disease and also chronic fatigue syndrome, MECFS. And we used our knowledge from the healthy brain and compared it with these two disorders. And we could see that there is actually molecular differences between healthy and ill. And we could also tell there are similarities and there's also differences between post-treatment Lyme disease and chronic fatigue syndrome. This paper has been downloaded now 39,000 times. Uh, maybe probably not by only clinical colleagues or researchers, but also by families and patients who are interested to see what, what we found. And in very brief, we found there is signs of a neuroinflammatory reaction, a low-grade inflammation in the brain. We also see there is a lack of some repair systems and some markers that actually resembles what we find in neurodegenerative processes. So there is something molecular, on a molecular level going on in the brain. When we study endogenous molecules, molecules from the body, we can do select different molecules to study. And this is just a list. We could look at genes, we could look at proteins, we can look at small molecular weights. And Bob and Chris already explained metabolomics for you. So uh, this is obviously when you focus on the small molecular weight compounds. Uh, if we do proteomics, as we did in these first studies where we published on MECFS, we study the proteins instead, the larger molecules, and we try to measure all of them at the same time. And this is, of course, impossible because there are so many of them. But the idea is to find what molecules are present at what time, together with what other molecules, and how do they interact. So it's sort of a holistic biology or system biology. And this gets extremely complex because even if we only have 25,000 to 28,000 genes that pro produce proteins. We have all the different protein variants. And as you see in this slide, the complexity increases dramatically just because we have different transcriptions, we have different processing, we have also different post-translation modifications, so small additions on the proteins. And this makes the complexity enormous. So we get maybe a million different proteins in our samples. Metabolomics then, as I said, then we focus on the small molecular weight metabolites. And unfortunately, it gets as complicated or even more complicated. And how come? Well, because the metabolites that we can measure, as we heard from Bob and Chris, they are affected by so many different things. So it's quite hard to actually decipher what is uh, change in the molecular fingerprint due to uh, illness what is changed just because we are, have different genes or we have different age or environmental issues, uh, drugs, nutrition, or lifestyle. And we want to pan out what is the difference in the disease in this case. We have the tools to some extent to do this. Uh, in one single droplet of blood, we can measure a few 
hundreds or thousands of different molecules. And we, in my lab, we do it in a targeted analysis. So we focus on different families of molecules that could be of interest. And I will just give you one example, just in, in a minute. The complexity is still there. So some molecules are there in very high concentrations, 12 orders of magnitude higher than the molecules that we may be most interested in. So of course that makes this challenging. We have to be very careful with the sample. We have to clean up the sample. We have to separate out the molecules of interest. This picture just shows you, it's based on a study of 4,000 healthy individuals. And you can see the variability of different molecules here with the small red dots is the median value, what is the healthy level, and the ranges is the bars you see. So in some molecules, you can have quite different concentrations and still be healthy, and in others, you have to be quite highly regulated to be at the exact right concentration to be healthy. Uh, we'll look at the molecules with different techniques. Uh, some were mentioned before. So we use mass spectrometry. It's a very expensive instrument that weighs the molecular weight and can make structural characterization of a molecule in a mixture. And we do some sample cleanups. We take cerebrospinal fluid or plasma sample. We separate, we clean up the molecules and we separate them in front of this balance mass spectrometer that can measure the weight of the molecules and then decipher what is the name of the molecule. Uh, we could go for a urine sample, look at the urines, uh, clean it up, get rid of the water, get rid of some salts, but then in the end, run the mass spectrometer and actually decipher the name of the molecule and the amount of that molecule. Uh, one example of these metabolites that are very interesting is steroids. And steroids are involved in so many things in life. As you know, we are actually born, or before we are born, we are all the same steroid-wise. And we also die, most of us, in the end of life with the same steroid profiles. We all die as old ladies, actually, <laughs> from a steroid point of view. You can tell, actually, if you look at old couples, they start to look quite a lot alike, actually. <laughs> Scary. Uh, steroids control so many different physiological functions. So reproduction and endocrinology is obvious, but maturation, gene expression, and important is neurological functions. And uh, in clinical routine, many of these steroids are measured routinely, but the problem is that we often measure only one at a time. So we don't get the whole full picture. And biosynthesis of steroids is extremely complex, and I won't go into any details here, but this is a biopathway of steroids, and this is extremely important to understand. Because if we change one parameter here, we will change the whole function of the steroid profile. So let's say we block one enzyme, called CYP21 in this case, we suddenly start producing loads of testosterone. That would not be a very good idea if you're a female, for instance. That can make, give big disturbances on many different features. So this is important. Uh, the challenge to measure these molecules are that they look exactly the same, or almost the same, all of them. They have the same structure, they are there in very low concentration, and they are hard to measure. But we have developed methods that can do that, and we can measure now a, para, uh, a set of of these profiles uh, for different steroids using high resolution mass spectrometry, this balancing machine, uh, and do it with absolute quantitations. We can tell exactly how are these expressed in the sample from the patient or from the control, and then compare the quantities. Another technique that was mentioned by Chris is the NMR, nucleic magnetic resonance, uh, and that's another instrument that can do quite good measurements and quantitative measurements on complex samples. And you can actually take the whole sample without separating it, putting it in a glass tube, put it into this quite expensive instrument, and by magnetic field look at the components in tissue samples, in cerebrospinal fluid, plasma, urine, stool, or fecal water samples. And uh, a urine sample <clears throat> would typically look like this. So you see that we can actually identify and quantify a quite high number of molecules without actually disturbing or destroying the sample. 
So the sample could, in principle, be reused for other, de other detections later uh, and do an absolute quantitation. And right now, we're doing a, a study on fecal water. We are interested in the microbiome, the gut microbiome, and see what happens in ME-CFS patients. So this is in a collaboration with Norwich Research Park in UK. We have 19 patients undergoing detection here. A lot of data analysis, I can tell you that. Uh, now let's go into some, some data we have on our Swedish population. And this is preliminary data, so unpublished. Don't tell anybody, please. Uh, what we are doing in collaboration with the German group in Berlin is that we are following a very interesting lead. And this group in Berlin, uh, run by Carmen Schienborgen, has uh, found that in her population of ME-CFS patients, 20 to 30 percent of their patients express autoantibodies. So immune systems start to produce antibodies against a molecular structure that we actually need. And the molecular structures are the receptors, two types of receptors, the beta adrenergic receptors and the muscarinic receptors. Beta adrenergic receptors reacts on uh, epinephrine and norepinephrine, and the muscarinic receptors reacts on acetylcholine or nicotine. Uh, and they found that. And we had the chance to work together with them and look at the Swedish population. Um, the advantage of going for a Swedish population is that we could collect cerebrospinal fluid and plasma sample in pairs. We had matching samples for both types of, of tissues. So we selected 25 of our patients. Uh, we had six healthy controls. Uh, and we did sex and edge match controls there. We followed our very strict protocol for selecting them. So they were uh, as pure group of patients as we could and also very good controls. And we were able to do this with uh, initiative and, and support from, uh, from Open Medicine Foundation. And we're very happy for that because this is the first time we got any funding for any research in this field in Sweden. Preliminary results. You should always be careful with preliminary results, but we could tell that there is, in our Swedish population, also a significantly upregulated presence of these autoantibodies against adrenergic and muscarinic receptors uh, in the plasma sample. However, in the cerebrospinal fluid, we don't find these autoantibodies. And this is a very important finding. Of course, you should always be careful with detection limits and uh, protein content and so on but we could not detect any autoantibodies in the central nervous system. And that is potentially a positive thing. If the autoantibodies are of importance in this case, maybe we can treat them in the periphery. We don't need to do treatment central nervous, in the central nervous system. Uh, another ongoing study uh, that we are doing is using a technology called proximity ligation assay. And I'm sorry, this picture is blurry still. I don't know what's happened. This is a magic picture. We have replaced this so many times. But I will explain what the method is shortly. You have a molecule of interest, in this case a protein, and you have two binders, two antibodies that you add to your sample. On those antibodies, we have put a single-stranded DNA. And the single-stranded DNA, when two binders get close enough, they can actually bind to each other. And when they bind to each other, you can use amplification technology like PCR, polymerase chain reactions and amplify that signal. So from one single molecule, you can actually get enough signal to measure that in a sample. This is a technology developed in Uppsala, actually, uh, by a company called Olink, and this is in a collaboration with uh, Torsten Gård, who is at uh, the pain clinic in, in Uppsala. In this study, what we did, we took our Swedish cohort of MECFS patients. We had a group of fibromyalgia patients from Torsten's research. We used our healthy controls, and uh, we have both CSF and plasma, as you see. Sex and age matched. All samples correctly handled, thanks to uh, the Open Medical uh, Medicine Foundation. We screened 92 different neuroinflammatory markers in these samples by the technique. A long list of molecules. Uh, the proximity ligation assay data were selected. We did statistics on it. We did uh, uh, 
linear discrimination analysis. We did ANOVA statistics on it. And what did we find? Well, preliminary results, don't tell anybody about it. 25 CSF proteins uh, were significantly different between the different groups. In general, these neuroinflammatory reactions were elevated in both fibromyalgia and ME CFS patients. In the plasma, we were a bit disappointed. We only found seven proteins that were sort of significant, but actually the difference between the control groups were larger than the patient groups. So that tells us one important thing. Even if the CF CSF cerebrospinal fluid is hard to get, it can tell us something more about what's going on in the central nervous system. So when you measure in circulation, you may lose or have lack of that signal uh, in the diluted sample of blood. So to summarize, what do we know? For sure, we know that it's a very complex pathophysiology we are studying. We have to put all our efforts in the research to actually be able to monitor what's going on. What do we think we know, and we still have to prove that, is that we have a disturbed fatty acid metabolism. We have an oxidative phosphorylation going on, so small modifications on proteins or other molecules. We have a general energy metabolism suppression. We have soluble factors, autoantibodies. What are their function? We don't know yet. We have a neuroinflammatory ongoing process, and we have a disturbed gut microbiome with effects on the metabolism. What do we need to know more? Well, can we validate these findings? Because that's extremely important. Validate in other cohorts, validate with other uh, patient groups, with other disorders. Uh, are we missing some targets due to the methodology? Yes, we are. We know that our methods are selective, so we will miss certain molecules of interest. And how should we continue? Well, collaboration is the key here. We have to collaborate, we have to share data, we have to be able to explore this field with all the resources we have. So, in my family, we have a, a family uh, code of honor, you can say, in, in Stockholm at the Nobel House. Uh, my name is Barry Kvist. Now some educational part again. Barry Kvist means in Swedish, mountain branch. And as you can see in the central part of the shield here, there is a small mountain. I would say maybe a hill, but anyway, a mountain. And there is a tree branch on top. But the most important thing is that someone in the family many years ago came up with a motto, the dev devise, Mödan min glädje in Swedish. And that, if you translate it, it means trouble is my delight. <laughs> I don't know how they, they should have done something better, I think. But anyway. <laughs> It's, it's encouraging, I think. <laughs> so, I think it's what we should focus on, and the take-home message is actually, we should try as much as we can to enjoy life. And we should also try to do what our best to actually help others to enjoy their lives and do what we can to solve, for instance, this disease. This is a picture when I was, just before summer, I was invited to go to Mongolia and do a... a what do you call it, a long distance ride through the Mongolian uh, steppe or wasteland. And that was a fantastic opportunity to see that nature. But you see, the tools were not super good. They were pretty poor, actually. <laughs> and the saddle is, was awfully tiring after 12 hours in there, I can tell you. Uh, but actually, we should use all the tools we have and uh, to reach out and get to, to this disorder and try to make the best we can. And I think all of us can help out with that. So my final slide. Uh, a, thank, a warm thank to all the patients on all the healthy controls that has given samples for this. Because that's very important. If we don't get good quality samples when we do our research, we should not be doing the research. We should maybe be out riding instead. I don't know. Uh, a warm thank to Open Medicine Foundation for the support and uh, also inviting us for this excellent meeting, the Swedish patient organization, of course, and a thank to all of you. Tack så mycket.